What's going on everybody? Welcome to Chop and Brew. I am Chip Walton. I'm in my lovely St. Paul, Minnesota dining room with the one and only Dono. We are here drinking a hard cider that I made from fresh pressed apple juice about a year ago. And that is the story of this episode. We're going back in time to an epic two day event where the primary fermenters, Brewer and Vintners Homebrew Club got together and as a a unified force processed 3,000 pounds of apples into nearly 250 gallons of cider that we all took home, split up, all did very different things with them. You're going to see this cool, I guess you could call it high-tech equipment that Josh Landy has on hand to crush these apples, a bladder press. It's a really cool process. And then we're going to fast forward about six months or so to a party where a bunch of club members got together and tasted many different versions of the 2017 and also the 2016 pressing. Real quick before we get rolling, we want to give a shout out to a couple of Patreon patrons for helping to keep the party going. Adam Joyce, Patrick Dahl, Paula Weber. Cheers to you. Cheers to, there's a lot of you. We're going to give you, we're going to roll these things out over the, the next coming years. So, but it's really important and it's really uh, meaningful that you guys throw in on this effort. So if you want to join them, Patreon, dot com slash chop and brew until then let's how about them apples man let's try it bam I'm Josh Landy and I'm with the Primary Fermenters. We're here for our fairly epic cider making day. Uh, I bought uh, something north of 3,000 pounds of apples uh, on Thursday from Chippewa Falls and we're pressing off four different kinds of apples today. We should be making somewhere north of 230 gallons of apple cider uh, with my apple press and mill, which is really kind of putting it through its uh, paces. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I bought a two horse apple mill that uh, was rated for about 2,400 pounds an hour, so we can really crank through a lot of apples in a pretty short period of time. Uh, having bought a lot of extra five gallons buckets makes it a whole lot easier because we don't have to stop and press and then go back and mill some more. Uh, letting those apples sit on skins for a couple hours doesn't hurt them either. Then we're gonna run it through the apple, uh, the, uh, the bladder press, uh, which is a little bit slower, but a heck of a lot faster than dealing with a, uh, the old school crank presses. Uh, well, those old school Happy, Happy Valley apple mills that you see, you know, people buying or using, uh, it takes about 20 pounds of apples to get a gallon of juice. So with the equipment that we've gotten and that we're using today, it's more like 13, maybe 14 pounds of apples. So it's a lot more efficient. And if you're making, you know, 10 gallons of cider a year, no, it's absolutely not worth it. If you're making a couple hundred gallons a year, yeah, it's totally worth it. Today we're dealing with Macintosh Regent, Con Connell Red and, Go and Golden Delicious. None of these are really particularly great cider apples. It's just a nice mix between the bunch. If you're looking for great cider apples, you have to look a lot harder and also usually pay a whole lot more. Uh, the, the U.S. basically killed its cider apple industry back after Prohibition, and we're just now having orchards starting to replant out varieties like Golden, uh, pardon me, Golden Russet, Roxbury Russet, uh, Kingston Black, and you know dozens or hundreds of others that are pretty scarce but make for amazing cider. With this many people, it's actually a lot of fun and it's pretty easy. Uh, we're, the, the apples were all bagged for us, which is both a ton of work for this guy, but a lot of fun. That we can just throw apples into the mill, and they'll come out on the opposite end, uh, just short of applesauce, and perfectly milled for cider. Uh, they can sit in the buckets until we put them into the bladder press. It takes about eight gallons of uh, apple mush, call it what you will, per run, and to get about uh, four gallons of apple cider. In which case, you know, people can tote it off and add their yeast or do wild yeast or whatever the heck they want to it. What a lot of people don't seem to remember or realize is the fact that uh, cider making is really white wine making, but with a different fruit source. Instead of grapes, you're dealing with apples. Uh, and instead of having a batch of IPA that's ready to go in three weeks, you have a batch that 
it's drinkable in a month or two, but really, I find that most ciders are really at their best between six and 15 months. And really that nine to 12 month window seems to be that sweet spot where most ciders really seem to show their best. The question is, are you willing to be patient enough to, for them to last that long? The stuff I'm working on over there is, uh, there's a, a small orchard south of Lanesboro that I've been working with, and they have a bunch of really cool old trees. They planted a bunch of heirloom cider apples 35 years ago and have never really done anything with them. Uh, having a lot of fun working with those, but the stuff that we're doing today is for some sort of event they're going to do on the 21st. So we actually picked a bunch of apples from very specific trees and I'm going to press those off so that they can have just raw pasteurized cider and do be able to talk about that this cider is from this tree, that cider is from that tree. And, uh, and be able to show off the differences in ciders, not just the fact that you know people think of apple juice being apple juice, that it really can vary in flavor and acid and tannin and profile. I've heard all sorts of things that people are doing. I'm not sure what they're going to do. I'm a big fan of uh, White Lab 775 English cider yeast. I think it's as many, the more I try other ciders, the other cider yeasts, other wine yeasts, the more I really like it. I'm a big fan of Cote de Blanc, and there's probably eight or ten others I'm going to be using this year, uh, just as ongoing experimentation to see what I like. Uh, well, I've been making all my own, almost all my own cider from apples for the last year and a half now. Uh, this will be my second season with this. Uh, I've made uh, some version of a French cider. Uh, I've done New England cider. I've made uh, apple wine, and I've made. 30 odd other batches of cider in the last year. Uh, variations with whether or not they were sizer or just cider with various and assorted things, different honeys, different adjuncts. Uh, last year I also didn't have access to some of the apples I had this year, or I will be getting this year. So it was a matter of like, take what you can get and what can I turn this into? Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. We're, we're, we're pressing off close to 200 gallons of cider today. And it'll be fun to sit, you know, meet together in three or six or nine months and see what all these different ciders from the same juice, you know, turned out as. You know, I've wanted to do a, a club thing where everyone made the same extra pale ale with the same ingredients and see how different they were. It never happened, but this will be kind of really a fun example of what, you know, how many different results you can wind up with the same juice. So from the fresh press, everybody took their ciders home, used different yeasts, different sugars, different fruits, different techniques. Uh, and then we got together about five or six months later at Bad Weather Brewing Company in their party room and we had a wonderful tasting of not only ciders but food. This was a chop and brew kind of event. Everybody brought a uh, dozen, dozens of varieties of cider. There was food from savory and sweet, pies, um, terrines, there was meatballs and pulled pork. Everything had to have cider. So it was a really lovely day. Um, and everybody voted for their favorite food and their favorite cider. Uh, and in the end, I got to talk to two cider makers, Kevin Meinsma. He had several awesome varieties to offer. And then Anna and Wes Ruel, they were the people's choice winner for this day at Bad Weather with their cherry cider. I took a moment aside to interview both Kevin and Anna to get their thoughts on cider, cider making, ingredients, and process. So here at the Primary Fermenters Cider Tasting, yeah. pressed apple cider tasting. I'm here with Kevin Meinsma, and you just had something awesome happen today specifically related to cider, didn't you? Yeah, in fact I did. I cleared the first round of the National Homebrew Competition with a gold medal. For? For a sizer, and it's the first sizer I've made and the third meat I've made. And tell me about the three things that you brought here. Okay, so I brought a spontaneously fermented cider from the same cider batch that the sizer was made with. Uh, I brought a Maibach, which also cleared the first round of nationals as a gold medal. So yeah. I'm pretty happy about that, having two beers move on. Yeah. Uh, and then I brought the sizer as well for people to taste so they would have a reference point for what happened at nationals. And you brought a New England cider. I did bring a New England, that's right. Forgot All that. from the apples that we pressed last fall. Correct. Tell yep. me about the process of those three ciders. So the spontaneous one was actually some leftover cider that yeah. I had in a two gallon bucket that I put in the fridge at about 32 degrees and just let it sit. And it slowly fermented and when it was kind of done, I bottled it and put it aside. That yeast wanted to make hard cider yes, very badly. it did, and it gushed out of the bottle a little, admittedly, but, yeah. you know, it tastes good, so yeah. it's okay. Uh, then for the sizer, I took the apple cider that we had from the press, and I added some Costco honey to it. So 
good quality but fairly inexpensive. And you know, when you're doing some of these extra ingredients, there's not really a great point in using designer label honeys because you lose most of that character okay. anyway. So that was my theory. Um, and then I fermented that fairly cool and let it go and it turned out really well. It the, did turn out really well. And England, apparently the judges thought so too. Yeah. The uh, New England cider was an uh, uh, addition of brown sugar in addition to the cider itself uh, and then just fermented in a bucket. I have a stainless bucket that I do most of this in. And it fermented out nice and clean and it's yeah. got a lot of character to it. It's got a lot of appleness yeah. to it without being like bone dry and still getting some sweetness. Right, yeah. I think the brown sugar lends a little extra character as well in that case. And of course for New England cider you have to build it up a bit because they're pretty high gravity. Yeah. So you got to have something else to help the cider along because most cider is in the 10, 40, 45 range, so you can't get there. What else did other club members bring? Uh, kind of get, sh tell me about the range of what you tasted today oh from last year's pressed ciders. We've got a huge range of stuff. So a couple of New England cider types, uh, some that had teas, um, other fruits added. There were, I think there's a cherry cider that turned out pretty well that mm -hmm. we had. Uh, a few of them used a bunch of different yeast varieties, so there's uh, a couple of Belgian yeast strains that were used to give it some different estery characters. Turned out pretty interesting. We had some really nice ciders come out of this press. And a lot of people brought 2016, which theoretically aren't in the running for last year's press competition. But the idea is what we've all learned is a lot of ciders really just take some time to fall into place, right? They do, and they keep well. So it's not a bad idea to kind of build up a cellar of ciders from a year or mm. two or three or four ago. And then based on how they turn out, you can then blend those into other things to get the characteristics you want. Even um, with a low-ish alcohol or gravity, you're saying they hold. It's not like a, a wine with strength. Cider. I don't know why. Hmm. I'm sure somebody's done a study. It'd be interesting to look and see if we could find something about Maybe that. Maybe the built-in acids. Could be. Extent. They are pretty acidic, and that's going to be a preservative character. And then Josh Landy had his educational area <laughs> off to the side, which was not in the running for competition. Right. But he's got 22. This yeah. is the cider master, so he's he's got some that are specifically acidic some that are specifically tannic and they are basically used to teach people about those components right and he also uses those for blending purposes right so you, you know you build a cider that's got a ton of tannin in it you don't want to just stick it out there by itself right but if you use a small quantity of that to blend into something that maybe didn't have enough it'll help to balance mm. yeah and i think i've told landy this before and i've seen this phrase <laughs> pop up a few times he doesn't have a alcohol or drinking problem he has a fermentation problem <laughs> fa fermentation is synonymous something like that well congratulations thank you on your first you. place good luck going right. into the second slash final it. round and yeah thanks for bringing the cider the spontaneous honestly was my favorite um you know there's certain things you know there's beers that you love where the marketing is actually better than the flavor. Mm. The story of that spontaneous oh, yeah. could easily just win it today's competition, but it also tastes yeah. very good. But it tastes low. I'm sure the alcohol is low. Oh, yeah. It's only going to be 3%, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, but that's nice. The New England one as well. But that spontaneous, I have a feeling, is going to is going to take the, the day's VIP here. Well, so. that sounds good to me. It's tough to beat Landy <laughs> in this kind of competition. So anytime I can... Put him under my thumb. I feel pretty good. Nice. All, All right. right. Cheers. Thanks again. I'm here with Anna, who, along with husband Wes, yes. are the co-cider makers of today's event's winning cider, which was? A uh, cherry cider that was um, had two cans of 100% cherry juice added in and then back sweetened with about a pound of sugar that we did with a simple syrup and added in after um, after the fermentation was completed. And this is actually from 2016 to prove the point that some ciders are not going to be ready in five months, right? Right. We, we definitely let our ciders just take their time and uh, don't tend to rush it. We usually buy far more than we are able to drink quickly. Um, so in the range of 25 or 30 gallons. And then um, each five gallons we try... Uh, try something new, usually using the Y yeast cider or um, Nottingham cider uh, yeasts are our two favorites. Um, and we've experimented with some other ones as well, but 
those tend to be pretty consistent and they have a really nice finish um, and, uh, and, and it's just a nice clarity um, and you can kind of back sweeten or add as you like along the way. What's kind of the full range of wacky things you have tried in cider? Is it kind of dialed in? Oh, we usually try something a little different um, every year. There's a few that we really, really like, just a, a regular sweet cider. Um, we've done a um, brown sugar and pear almost every year that always comes out really nice. Um, and then usually some sort of fruit cider. So we also submitted an apricot cider this year that um, scored well but wasn't the winner. Um, and that's probably going to mellow out and, and uh, be really, really smooth and delicious. But I like fruit ciders with sort of a, a semi-sweet finish. And those are crowd pleasers. Everybody seems yeah. to like. And the color on this, the color on this one as well is just beautiful. Thank I you. heard that Bo used food coloring. Oh my God, did he really? He said he added it to the keg or the bottle just today. I was like, I'm so glad you didn't win because that would be so yeah, unfair. Yeah, not allowed. No, the cherry um, has so much color to it. And then actually, um, Josh Landy, who's a, um, a well-known cider brewer um, and mead maker and all sorts of other um, delicious spirits, um, he often uses... Um, tea, like a hibiscus or um, other types of fruit teas that can add some really nice color depending on what you're using um, and just some really nice aroma and floral notes to it, which is something that I haven't tried but I'm planning on trying with our next batch of cider. What would you say to anybody in a club that hasn't tried a bulk buy but it's kind of on their radar? Oh, definitely give it a try because it's really simple. It's very inexpensive to get started, unlike brewing. Um, you you need so much less equipment. I mean, you really just need, we started with just a five gallon bucket, um, getting the right cider, um, cider yeast or trying something, and then, um, and then experimenting. And you can do it in as small as one gallon batches, but usually just start Start somewhere, and that's an easy, easy way to start. And it's it's very it does not need to be intimidating at all. All right, cheers, congratulations. Thank you. Woo -hoo. Cheers. We're back here in the living room. You've seen fresh press cider. You've seen a party where we drink a bunch of really good ones. Shout out to Kevin, Anna, and Wes for their excellent um, offerings. This is my excellent offering. So this is one half. This was uh, I think I brought it home and just gave it the candom tablet treatment, maybe for like a day or so, let it ferment bone dry. I believe it was something like 1045 and it went down to 998. So theoretically that's about like 6.2. And is, then usually- Is that the yeast? Yes, yeah, this was, so it was White Lab 775 English cider yeast, which I've never used before. Usually I'm a Cote de Blanc guy. White Labs, in a tube? Or do they have a different pouch? No, it's in now? this pouch now. That it's kind of like oh, a, a, different pouch. a long pouch. Okay, yeah, I haven't used it for a long time. And uh, I was really happy with it dry, which is the way we usually do it. Also, just a fan of bone dry cider, and mm. so am I, champagne -y, But Don O generally back sweetens his, so I took a cue from him. Um, you use, you say you do three of those thawed concentrates per five gallon. Yep. So I only had three gallons, and I only had one concentrate. I was like, oh, that's half, or, you know, 40% mm -hmm. um, sweetness. So I added this in. It went up to 10.008 and I kegged it and it is noticeably sweeter and it's nice. It is very moderately sweet. Having been familiar with how these ciders can come out when they're at 0 0.998, yeah. they can be pretty acidic. They can have an edge to it, a punch in the face, yeah. and it is nice to have a little bit of sweetness. This has a little bit of that sweetness, but it is not the up to the three cans of concentrate per five gallon type ratio okay. level of sweetness. Yeah, I get a, like a lot of kind of green apple, apple. I can't get over how nice it smells. It yeah. really smells like apple juice, which is unusual in my experience when you're smelling cider. It doesn't well, smell generally... like apple juice. What does it usually smell like? Um, That's a good question. I don't really know if I can say what it smells like, but it doesn't smell like this because when I smell this cider, it struck me as unusual and nice, and also a little bit different than it tastes. I think I would expect it to be yeah. even sweeter based on the apple juice aroma, but it does have a little bit of the the tartness, the dryness. Yeah. Very lightly sweet. 
This is definitely, to me, more enjoyable than not having it sweetened, back sweetened okay. at all. But everyone has their preference. You can do cider any number of ways. Related, last night, uh, I have occasionally bottled, if I have too much cider that I can fit into a keg, especially if I'm adding the concentrate, I'll just throw some into a bottle, like just dry, mm -hmm. and just keep it, you know, unsweetened. And I opened a... Mm. One last night that was not supposed to be carbonated. You know, it wasn't carbonated, just still, just put in a cork top thing. And it was super good. Like, I couldn't believe how good it was. Just probably sat around for two, three years. I didn't write a year on it. <laughs> but the point is, is like, cider, like you talk about that six month mark. Yeah. That that's that might not even be that good. I mean, a lot of times, yeah. that stuff just needs a yeah. good year or more to really yeah. get get good. Yeah. And however old this dry cider was, I don't really like it that that dry when it's young and sharp, but it was it tasted really nice. Mm. Smoothed out. I think that's why when they had their party at Bad Weather, they weren't insistent that it had to be from last year's yeah. pressing cuz at that point, last year's pressing ciders were only like 5 months old. Yeah. And or like the depending minutes what you're doing with them. are like get your juice in early November, bring the cider to the Christmas thing. I'm like, <laughs> no. I mean, <laughs> not that your cider. One more thing is you can tell Josh Landy, who hosted the Fresh Press, is slightly insane, obsessed, and highly knowledgeable about cider making. As you saw in the um, tasting video when we were at the event, he has this like list of all these different varieties, all these different yeasts, and he loves to just get people's takes on what their favorite was. So at one point, very soon, I want to sit down with Josh at, on his turf in his basement filled with dozens of six gallon carboys of cider wow. and we're gonna walk through and this guy's fermented with champagne beer yeast mead yeast i mean you know it was shocking during the tasting one of a lot of people's favorites was actually a burton ale yeast which i never would have thought of using so we're gonna sit down and pick his brain and i think that'll be a very good episode coming up but until we go to josh's cider filled basement uh press for press apple for apple Apples to apples? Apples to apples. It's like comparing apples and apples. <laughs> it's like comparing these apples to those apples. These apples! These apples. Okay, I think that that'll work. I think that'll cover as much as... Cut it out. Tell me kind of about mm -hmm. about the stations, kind of about the, the parts that need to run together to make this happen pretty quickly. Sure. Tell me what kind of apples we're dealing with here today. Yeah, what are some of your ideas? To What what are you doing with some of this? What have you heard other people doing? Enjoy the cider app. Oh, God. The cider app. Yeah. This episode, for short. Sure. I don't know how I'll set this part up, but... Check, check, check. It's Mainsma. 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 Pretend the T isn't there. Well, you probably haven't seen it spelled, so. No, I have. That's why I wasn't okay. sure. Yeah. Um, I think you said the amount. Like, tell me, though, if someone wants to press at home, it's kind of what's that ratio of uh, apple to juice? Um, 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 maybe kind of like a, almost like a send-off, kind of like, you know, we still got a long ways to go, but we're, we're going to, we'll meet back up and taste some of the various. Sure. Nightmare before Christmas every Halloween, and then we watch it again at Christmas. Because we're crazy like that. Elsa actually just bought Coraline and Frankenweenie. It's so like our I've movie collection of those. is solely based on holiday viewing. All right. Planes, trains, and automobiles on Thanksgiving. Groundhog Day on Groundhog. <laughs> it keeps it there real. You go. Any reason to watch a movie? Christmas story. Oh, yeah. And now we have the. Never mind. It's like a documentary about the Christmas story. It's crazy. All right, I mean, some of this I could even voice over during the video or just like throw up, pew, 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 pew. And then we can, I don't know when we'll do the tasting. We can just come back and be like, hey, so that was a year ago. Don and I are gonna do a quick tasting before we show you a party where, I don't know, I don't know the order. Or in the oh. beginning, I can just say, we're gonna take you to the pressing, then a party where people drink some, and then Don and I will meet you back here for a quick, maybe that's what I'll do. Because then I could do one of those, like, 
six months later kind of thing and then just go to the video and not have to like wedge a chunk of us talking in the middle. All right. You're like, why am I here for the first part? It's hanging out. All right.